have the lights, the demo, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to echo, just take two minutes to echo the similar feeling that you heard this morning when Professor Talwar went on the podium and when Professor Roy Chaudhary came on, on the podium. Is it how wonderful it would be to be in the university, you know, ambience, and wonderful ambience. Um, I would like to also extend my feelings and thanks to the organizers, uh, the IAS University, the University of Rajasthan, the Mahatma Gandhi University of Science and uh, Medical Technology for putting up this uh, national conference together. And on top of it, the umbrella of ISSRF, which actually uh, has been doing all uh, such wonderful activities. And in that uh, uh, line of action, uh, I must acknowledge and I would request, and I think you all will have a similar kind of feelings, where the present President uh, Professor Loya comes with uh, such kind of themes which are uh, very relevant to present scenario in Indian contest. The last national conference, if you if you are part of it, was about the awareness uh, regarding the reproductive health, and this uh, national conference is again the reproductive health issues, the challenges, and the remedies. I mean, such themes are very relevant. In, in the contest where we have, we are talk about overall reproductive health uh, program, or so to say, health for all program uh, for India. And reproductive health program is one such which needs to be addressed uh, very aggressively. So having said that, I must congratulate once again Professor Loya, having given a thought in this direction, and bringing not only basic researchers, clinicians, academicians, and I was going through the list of participants who have participated. And this is a midterm activity. I mean, it looks like a, a whole symposium uh, of a level where I, I was in Dubai just 10 days ago. So I'm going to talk about a part of reproductive health which relates to uh, a very high global burden uh, about the reproductive tract cancers, and basically gynecological cancers, and also about the breast cancer, which are the leading, uh, you know, two cancers of, uh, in the women, not only in uh, developing countries, but in uh, developed countries as well. So they, they rank top. And especially in India, uh, we have the major problem as far as cervical cancer is concerned and the breast cancers are concerned. So I'm going to talk about that and the challenges that we face and how our basic research has gone into. So I will go quickly on to just few slides which will reflect the statistics that we can look at. Is I just want to focus your attention on that the cancer is such a deadly disease that it accounts for the number of people dying because of AIDS, hepatitis, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. Cancer takes a you know, toll equivalent to that, much more than that. It's a very aggressive problem. And especially in developing countries, as I was discussing with Professor Roy yesterday, as I was discussing this morning as well, we have less awareness on which Professor Loya had organized national conference last bit, you know, activities. And we have a limited medical infrastructure, so to say, where we can do screening methods to detect early so that the treatment modalities could be uh, not limited by the technicians. So, having said that, uh, I will just skip this slide because I want uh, to have a discussion at the end. And we all know that one out of eight women will have breast cancer and that's something which is very alarming. Okay. And for early detection for breast cancer, we do have modality that you can, one can go for mammography after the age of 45, 50, alternate year and then every year after 55. And you get most of the time positives and you can have early detection one can be treated, but we don't have so good, so good infrastructures for cervical cancer where we do normally a cervical cancer do the pap smears, but then that kind of facility is not again available at the grassroots level with the problems. Are. So that's what the major problem is. So therefore, there is a basically a need for a biomarker which can be used 
for early detection as a target, as a therapeutic model, or as a therapeutic, uh, you know, immunotherapy. In the end, I'm going to talk about a little what I'm saying. So, what I'm aiming now is to take over you uh, to the slide that that I always like. That that is our, our vision is very clear to bridge between the clinicians and the scientists. We need to listen to to the clinicians so that we can bring these clinicians together and try to develop, improve the care for the cancer patients and the new scientific discoveries can come out of such kind of approaches. And this has only happened and I am standing here just because of all these collaborators from various hospitals that you see here and all my laboratory people, they actually marry well along uh, with these all clinicians of various hospitals. And you will hear Dr. Nirmala Jitneesh will talk about one of the molecules that we have identified. So this cohesiveness was only possible by just listening to the clinicians and listening to their problems, not we going to, to tell them that we can do such kind of gene analysis or microarray analysis. We were going them, going to clinicians, approaching them all the time to find out what actually you need. They need early detection, they need prognosis, they need protective biomarkers, they need pharmacokinetics, whether the drug is going to work or not. So these were the major challenges the clinicians were facing and we addressed that. What we did is, you have a reverse translation and a translational research. When I say reverse translational, reverse translation means it's coming from clinics. The questions, you know, the kind of questions, every twice a week I go to the hospitals, meet with the clinicians and they have all sorts of questions. I, you won't believe the kind of questions they can ask you. So the questions coming back from the clinicians, from the clinicians in the laboratory and basically they come from patient and then from the laboratory to the clinic, which is what the translation is research. This is what the first line of Bobby, Mr. Bobby just mentioned, you know, we need to do a translation research. Yes, we need it. Our society needs it and we have to do it. So basically we are talking about research investigation, discovery, clinical trials, medical treatment therapy. This has to, this loop has to be completed. And this can be only completed if you can bring the patients into the program. Patients are the key players in this whole program. They are the passport uh, for my program because patients, tissues, they have all details, the clinical uh, presentation is all histological grade, everything is detailed is given. So patients are the key partners in the biomarker discovery platform. Uh, so my lab is engaged in uh, focusing on one such uh, type of unique protein called cancer testes antigens. These are the molecules which are expressed only in testes and not in any other somatic tissues, but they are also expressed in a variety of uh, uh, cancers. So hence, if these cells are targeted, they can be wiped off the cells who are expressing CD antigens and should theoretically cause no side effects of target effects on normal tissue and This was published in Cancer Testes Antigen. Bob Weinberg actually wrote about this that we need to explore these targets. So I'm going to I'm going to take a little skip few slides. Basically, this is a translating basic research to clinical research. So we took almost 17 years after we established this molecule in our lab, you know, now where we are. So uh, I'm skipping a couple of slides here so that we have more discussion. So this particular molecule is called uh, SPAG9. And SPAG9 is uh, standing for Sperm Associated Antigen 9. And we, uh, we initiated our studies in cervical cancer, used uh, four different cell lines and used uh, the, the SIRM approach just to knock down uh, the, the protein and, and see uh, what happens actually on the phenotype characteristics of the cells. So what you see on this uh, particular uh, cartoon is that it is uh, as good as the SPAG SHRNA when it knocks down, you can see the cells almost dying. Uh, within within the in vitro assays, which is as comparable to the cisplatin when you incubate the cells, the same cisplatin with, with hourly observation. Uh, we also uh, simulated similar kind of conditions where 
uh, cells were actually transfected with SHRNA for invasion assays, uh, which is what is uh, here, uh, uh, migration assay and invasion assay. So this is something that you transfect the cells with the control SHRNA and this is the target SPAG9 which actually inhibits or knockdowns the protein which reduces the number of cells which migrate through the matrix gel and this is exactly the same as depicted in a higher magnification you see a cancer cell migrating. So this was very encouraging for us to know that yes uh, this is this is the molecule which is involved in all types of phenotypes that can render to the survival cancer cells. We went ahead, checked into in vivo model system and we saw the gene silencing approach uh, can in fact reduce the tumor size uh, significantly when injected with SHRNA against SPAG9. So this is the kind of basic study got published and we were happy. But then, there on, uh, we laid our hands now on the tissue banks and we published in four different cancers, in ovarian cancer, in uh, breast cancer, in cervical cancer, these two papers. And simultaneously we patented it and now we went on to the patient tissue samples. So we had total of 376 patients, although they were all, uh, you know, stages early, which is stage one, two, uh, you know, one, two, three, A and three B, because after that they normally don't do anything to these patients and the option, treatment options, modalities are also very limited. So what you see over here is that we could see actually 84% of the early stages patients were expressing SPAG9 and this is basically a gene detection that we do with in-situ RNA hybridization. Similarly, we had 80% of the patients which were stage 3A, 3B expressing the SPAG9 gene. We went ahead and did the validation of this gene now and what we found was yes, the antigen was expressed in these tissues again around 84% so there was no discrepancy in the gene level in the tissue and similarly in the late stages, stage 3 A and 3 B, the, the antigen was expressed. So thereby confirming that if this antigen is overexpressed in these tissues, can we make this uh, molecule as a target for further uh, development of treatment modality? The other question which was coming in our mind, which actually now we are going on a larger scale validation, is to try to develop uh, as a early detection biomarker in the fields by just taking a drop of, of, of a blood, like we do uh, a sugar check, a glucose check, is that you can uh, have a drop of blood and we are coating the antigen on the strip and then the antibodies are parallelly put against uh, the secondary antibodies parallelly put on the similar strip and then you incubate with the patient's serum and we have patented that uh, already in five different countries and within India also. So what actually you see here is, yes, this is a normal control that was matched with the number of patient samples that we had and total number of patients again we had 376. So almost we had uh, uh, higher stages, you know, we could have in early patients, early stages, 100% almost uh, patients were positive, found positive, which actually uh, reduced to stage 2 and then again increased to 90% in stage 3 and 3B. And uh, this was something very encouraging and we are still actually expanding this validation uh, at a, on a greater or uh, larger scale because uh, for cervical cancer, a uh, woman walking into the clinic for pap smear or for other assays is not that easy, it's not strive, you need a very uh, skilled, uh, at least semi-skilled uh, people who can take the smears and look at the microscope if the clinician is not available. But this method, if we can actually uh, develop and translate it at the field level, certainly will, certainly will help a lot of people uh, for early detection. And they will have, uh, clinicians will have better treatment options. Um, so, having established its basic uh, molecule, molecular uh, function in the cell types, then went into the tissue type, then we have tried 
this molecule uh, for cancer immunotherapy. Now this work, most of uh, the work was done uh, at the Cancer Institute Adia in Chennai by Dr. T. Rajkumar. Concept is well known that this is a dendritic cell based vaccine therapy where you, you need to know if your antigen or the tissue per se of a tumor is expressing the antigens which are not expressed by the normal cells they can be primed and then these DCs can be injected back into the patients and then they educate the T cells and that's how the T cells will take care of the cancer cells by recognition eventually by cytotoxicity. So what you see over here is immunity goes uh, down, the defense is going down, the immunity, immunity is lighter so the tumor progression actually takes place. If you can educate the immunity in a better way, make it heavy defense goes up and the tumor can regress. So this is a joint program that we initiated in 2005. At that time we used only uh, tumor lysate. Uh, 14 patients were used initially and uh, in phase 1 clinical trials. Uh, we had three arms. Uh, this, this Most of the study was done in, in Chennai and here. So three strong, three arm study was a saline was taken alone, unprimed mature dendritic cells and tumor lysis primed mature dendritic cells. So basically 14 patients uh, were recruited and 13 had completed three doses of vaccination. Here we had 10 to the power 12 uh, PBMCs uh, which were isolated after phresis and they were primed with tumor lysate and 1 million dose of bi-weekly and then monthly were given but they were uh, here, uh, 13 had completed three doses of vaccination. One patient declined further doses after the first dose, and one patient didn't have a DTA done. So basically, the the 12 patients uh, could complete. Since it was not very well organized at that time, the follow-ups were uh, not done that way. But I'm going to share one of the patient uh, history which was the outcome of uh, phase 1 clinical trial. This is a 50 years old stage 3B uh, squamous cell carcinoma patient was treated between 2003 December to February 2004. She had ulcerated lesion lesions in vaginal walls, x-ray chest, it was metastasized. Uh, this was randomized to arm 3, completed her 3 doses and the patient was had a progressive worsening and she was sent back. And one fine day, uh, she was she walks into the clinic, uh, and what Dr. T. Raj Kumar's team found was this: she had this lesion in 2004 that you can see on on her chest, which grew in 2004-11, which further grew in 2005, and after the treatment, you can see completely gone. Whereas she had refused that after the four cycles of cisplatin based chemotherapy she was left you know because they didn't know whether she's going to respond to the kind of treatment they have given to her or not but eventually after the treatment she completely re remission was done and she's still alive so based on the observations uh, recorded during this trial first we have now uh, entered the phase two clinical trial, double blinded again, uh, where now uh, this program has uh, taken a little bigger shape, uh, which will have a 54 patients now. Uh, there will be three arm again. This is a conventional current uh, concurrent chemotherapy, and the second arm will be conventional concurrent chemotherapy with DC primary patients on tumor lysate, and 18 patients will be having chemotherapy plus DC plus with the SPAG9. And this has been uh, outsourced to the Bicons engine for GMP GMP production. Uh, we have already got drug control of uh, Government of India clearance of March 3rd uh, for undertaking these trials and these will be initiated. The trials will be open uh, once the drug substance uh, actually gets completed uh, by the Bicon engine to be handed over to, to the Cancer Institute Adia. In other words, this molecule has taken 20 odd years of uh, journey from, from the lab to reach to now for a clinical trial. Initial trials were very encouraging, 
we have now almost done 800 patients and found this molecule to be very immunogenic and we hope that when we use this molecule uh, certainly we will have some uh, outcome which will be a benefit to our society and in, uh, in other words this will be if this is successful this will be some kind of uh, history of translational medical research in India not in India across the globe uh, so uh, I, I like this person because he got a Nobel Prize and he, he had a prostate cancer too and he got this Nobel Prize because uh, he was refused to, to be given any chemos or any treatment for that reason and he from 1971 he was trying to develop some sort of uh, cell based vaccine therapy for the cancer and he initiated dendritic cell based vaccine therapy and he prolonged his life for four years by using his own tumor lysate, by priming his own dendritic cells and injecting back to himself. The day he got Nobel Prize, actually he was not alive, he was on ventilator, but he got a Nobel Prize. Thorough gentleman. So what is the take home lesson? What are the lessons learned? I mean, what is the right way? Right way is that, that Professor Loya says all this, awareness. It's very important. That was the question I, were, I had actually asked Bobby. We have to make our people aware for God's sake that they have to go to the hospital or at the primary health care for their checkups. Their, it's their right to get it checked. Because we are all prone to such kind of uh, problems. So you come out, you go for the checks, early detection can cure more than 90% of the patients can be totally disease free if, if diagnosed early. This is, this talks about awareness. So what are we trying to do in this direction? We are trying to do biomarker discoveries. So we are, as I was explaining in the beginning, biomarker means we are looking for a molecule which can actually be used for early diagnosis, early detection. It can be used for a predictive because the patient comes in, we can talk about his prognosis, how much will be the survival of that person. Then we can talk about the productivity of the chemotherapeutic agent that we are want to use for that particular patient. And then of course the pharmacokinetics. Similarly, we want to use these molecules for neural target therapy. We have already patented that. The monoclonal antibodies against the molecules which are working wonderfully in in vivo system. And we probably will be taking that up also in, in the clinical trials in next two years time. And then cell-based vaccine therapy is already will be going for for human trials. I think we have to be together. Uh, I don't call myself dissociated from clinicians. I subject myself to clinicians. I listen to them all the time, and I listen to their questions. And that's why uh, I stand here with such kind of information. I think we have to be together to fight for this such a global burden and a global problem especially for the woman and the liberty health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Anil, for finishing before time, it's time for questions. Yes, please. Thank you, Dr. Suri. Uh, my name is Patel, NRRH Mumbai. Uh, wonderful. Uh, you see, there are an excellent vaccine. Maybe a reality. I had a couple of regarding uh, the immunogenicity of uh, the antigen here, which is spagmine molecule. Your, your the, signals the, are dropping. Yeah, yeah the spagmine molecule. Yeah. So you showed us data uh, about detecting humoral immunity or other antibody titers in patients uh, that had cancer and uh, their correlation. So I was wondering, uh, did you look at whether titers correlated with disease progression in any of these individuals? Uh, number one and number two, the dendritic cell uh, approach that you're using uh, that would uh, kind of presuppose uh, HLA alleles contributing to the uh, immunity. So, would you uh, propose trying to figure out if there is a particular HLA um, haplotype that would work better or in it would be more effective than another? Question your question one, which is like immunogenicity. Is immunogenicity correlated with the tumor aggressiveness? The answer is no. The reason is that the the bird the, the, the cancer progression 
although there is this molecule is highly immunogenic initial stages that is why you see we published in cancer epidemiology prevention biomarker uh, magnesium cancer research where we where we showed that in the breast cancer in early stages the antibody titers were very high as they go later stages as the grades are from grade 1 to the grade 3 the antibody titers go down so what does it show what does it reflect it reflects that the burden the, the proliferation and the antibody response cannot catch up together so there is no uh, if you have low titer you can't say the patient has a grade 3 no 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 that's yeah, that's yeah, not yeah, correct yeah. Point that for the answer, CMI is important. Yes, sir. Cell-mediated immunity, not necessarily local. Correct, sir. So, which is why I was wondering about yeah. the HLA yeah. haplotype. So, therefore, you see his sensor that the titers don't match. Correct. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. So, long as you include that there is CMI, absolutely. which is also to be that is that absolutely. You know, CMI is very important to there are, there are trials actually specifically going on on some of the cancer tests antigens I can name like NYESO1 which is New York esophageal 1 then MAGE which is a like melanoma antigen 1 then GAGE you know these are the few antigens which are cancer tests antigens now they don't look at the patient uh, actually this is personalized kind of medicine remember this if a patient is expressing SPAC9 tissue basically what do you do when you take a tumor tissue uh, from a patient you just take and you, we were making cytosol here we are going to see if SPAC9 is over expressed that tissue we are going to use GFP GLP you know uh, so the antigen. absolutely and put it back so th there is nothing that we are chasing in immunological apparatus but what Professor Talwar says is CMI is important. So we are trying to mediate and educate uh, use cell mediated immunity to actually kill the tumors. Now, listen, these patients who will be surgically uh, treated and chemo and then these DCs. So there is not that, so that was the three arms. So in cases where we cannot do any radiation, any uh, surgery, then radiation plus DCs can, can be the option. So this is some something that has to go stepwise. We, we can't treat the patients uh, directly uh, with these cells only. Any other question by anyone else? Yes, please. Over there. Yes, During his last case, uh, Professor Stenman wrote some review articles and he stated one of the critical points for development of hepatitis C vaccines. And that was uh, since patients are already in an immunosuppressive state, uh, this limits the success of hepatitis C vaccines. So I need your suggestion that uh, you suggest something which can be used or which can be adapted for, uh, to overcome these suppressive state issues. Yes, that's, that's a good question. Uh, what he's saying is that when the tumor actually is at the later stages, his immune system is almost compromised. Now, remember what you are trying to do here is there is a fatigue set in, in in the cancer patients. There is a fatigue set in in the immune cells, but there are naive cells which are actually uh, available in, in the in the patient. So, what we actually anticipate that we will be taking peripheral mononuclear cells and educate them and put them back anticipating that they will be able to educate the T cells and that will be enough. Now there is also uh, uh, the trials that, that are on that we wanted to initiate is uh, T cell adopted transfer on the same patients if we can inject our you know gene of interest and get it expressed on the surface and put these cells back and get the cytotoxic effect so that might help. So these are all uh, you know dark and light side of the shadow, you know, the coins. We really don't know. We have to go out after this. And there's a lot of hope on the cell based vaccine. There's whole Society of Cancer, Society of Immunotherapy, US. Who is, I mean, Any other question? And this will be the Any first time in India, actually. I have just one query. Yes, yes. You had virtually 100% uh, diagnosis. One. At stage one. Same. But why then it's clearly evident you are not able to find the reach that 
Sorry? Later you walk, the rest the number of cases are become positive. When cancer is clinically evident, you have less number of cases positive rather than stage when stage one, it is very difficult to diagnose clinically. No, as I said, uh, in, in stages, early stages, what happens is when the expression takes place for a non-self antigen, there is a clonal expansion of the, you know, antibodies. No, but your number of cases are very few. Only yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, that's you, another problem. If you increase that's, the number that's, of cases. Absolutely. <laughs> that's another problem. That is Early problem. stages patients is very difficult to get. Yeah. No, that's, that's another problem. These pa patients were not walking into the clinics for, for getting screening for something. They were getting screening for something else. Yeah. So early stages patients are always limitation as far as the later stages patients are. You rightly said. There are 12 or 24 patients as compared to 116 patients of stage 3. But you are talking about the SRE RNA. Yeah. Uh, that's the tumor therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, you may reflect that there was a Jenner sense which was developed only for uh, anti-cancer. That the first anti-sense molecule to enter the clinical trial and it failed. So then they made it antibody. After that, actually surprisingly, theoretically speaking, all anti-sense drugs should work, but none has been found to be working. Yeah, so it, that is a surprising thing. This, this is very interesting. But that's how you how mean, no, this. I also collaborate with NCI. And there is a saying in the corridors when you walk into, and they say, you know, your target might be right, Dr. Roy, but the biology is wrong. So, uh, as you rightly said, uh, 99 failures uh, in, in the drug. I am on their board of confidentiality. And yes, and uh, when gene therapy came, you know, Indra Verma said, everything is done, all problems will be solved, nothing has been solved. We have also patented SHRNA approach because we think if we can deliver somehow uh, locally in smaller molecules or integrate, eventually, I don't know, after 10 years probably there will be some technology. There is, uh, there is a speaker who is coming in, in this session only where they, he or she is going to talk about nano delivery particles to DC based uh, vaccine. So, yeah. Thank you very much for being Yeah, thank you. I was just going to ask about nano-based technology because since that thing now, yeah. they have found a nano-based uh, delivery system which is much more effective. So is that a possibility? Yes. Yeah. Very nice. I, I propose it. No, the problem with the nano-based is ah. that uh, it passes through the blood-brain barrier. The toxicity is a major problem. Toxicity diagrams have yet not been developed for the nano particles anywhere in the world. And they are using carbon nanotubes still worse because they get aggregated at places. So they have to go anywhere in the brain and get aggregated. So you end up with a large number of them. This is a apraxel, which is actually aluminum conjugated uh, paclitaxel, which Professor Julka wanted us, yes, which he wanted us to conjugate our stuff and use it in, 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 in vitro, in vivo system. We are doing that. So cross our fingers. So, uh, yeah. may, may I suggest that uh, because the continuation of the person, the person who is speaking on nanoparticles delivery for cancer may be invited now so that it's a you know a little bit of a relationship yes. of a theme going on rather than ups and downs yeah. okay we can call as suggested by the person why we can call our quick mark it is around yeah please come honorable chairperson distinguished dignities Delegates, my dear friends. I'm thankful to the organizers for providing me this opportunity to present my work on this prestigious platform of ISTAR. Thank you very much. The work which I'm going to present was directed at Tatagunya Center Mumbai and in collaboration with Central University of Bangladesh Sagar. It is a preclinical assessment of nanoengineered dendritic cells for selective targeting of tumor initiating cells in female reproductive tract cancers. Uh, just I will, I will like to disclose that the work is a part of PCT application and has been supported by different funding agencies. To start with dendritic cells, uh, already Sir has uh, 
shown in a lot of slides in Dendite Excess, it will be easy for me to uh, make you understand that Dendite Excess are the professional antigen present in cells of our body. They process and present ant antigens to knife cells for recitation of primary immune responses. Uh, cell, the cells were initially discovered by Professor Rolf and Steinman in 1973 when he was working at Rockefeller University on macrophage biology. Uh, Professor Steinman received Nobel Prize in 2011 for his seminal contribution, but uh, unfortunately, he lost his life from pancreatic cancer just before receiving the prize. And this is a typical uh, uh, morphology of genetic uh, cells. They look like spine like projections. They have uh, different uh, surface markers, including CD1A, CD11C, CD83. They have postulatory molecules like CD86. They can be generated uh, from myeloid lymphoid progenitors in the presence of GMCSF and IL4. Uh, this is the basic classification of dendritic cells. They can be divided on the basis of their surface receptors. They can be myeloid disease, plasmatic disease, Langerhans disease, or inflammatory disease. Uh, this is the basic approach that how dendritic cell based vaccines are generally, generally developed. Initially, blood is isolated from patients, and peripheral mononuclear cells are, uh, are, are isolated through density uh, grade certification. They are cultured in the presence of GMCSF and IL4 for generation of dendritic cells. Thus, form that dendritic cells are in immature form, and maturation is an important phenomenon when we talk about cancer vaccines because mature dendritic cells are considered as more mutagenic in comparison to mature dendritic cells. So, they are, uh, they are stimulated by a, a proper stimulating agent. The mature dendritic cells are then co incubated with tumor antigens for tumor antigen loading, and then this tumor antigen loaded dendritic cells are injected back to the patients followed by immune and clinical monitoring. Now, this is what is supposed after injection in the, uh, in the body that these uh, dendritic cells they present antigens to knife these cells for elicitation of tumor specific cytotoxic responses. Now, there are different clinical considerations when we, when we talk about vaccines, it should be keep in mind that is age of the patient, post immune competence, post, post HRA type, previous or concurrent cytotoxic treatment, or and most importantly, GMP issues. Now, keeping this a strategy, a lot of clinical trials have been conducted. Uh, from uh, starting from prostate cancer, breast, kidney, colorectal, ovarian, urinary, and lung. Still, uh, since a lot, lot of clinical trials have been conducted and they have achieved success, but their success is limited. The major problem with this type of vaccines is, as I uh, as I asked the question, that the suppressive microenvironment in, in the tumor, which tumor cells induce suppressive microenvironment for their immunological skin, and this suppressive microenvironment limits the success of dendritic cell cancer vaccines. So there is a need of designing certain strategies which can be uh, which can enable these cells to overcome immune suppression. So this is the this is the strategy which we propose. Yeah. Yeah. Tumor cells generate a suppressive microenvironment, and this suppressive microenvironment uh, is for the immunological scale. The yeah, there are different different molecules, different cytokines, sub suppressive cytokines are released. There are sub different certain suppressive uh, cells are uh, regulation which regulates the suppressive microenvironment, generates a immunological suppression for their skin. Now, there is a strategy which we propose that instead of uh, directly pulsing tumor antigens to dendritic cells, if you encapsulate this uh, tumor antigens and then you use the encapsulated tumor tumor antigens. Pulse dendritic cells, this instead of a direct burst, this will release in prolonged and sustained tumor antigen release, and this will be helpful in uh, dendritic cells to overcome uh, immunological dominance. Now, uh, why nanoparticles? Because they are biocompatible, bi have low diffusivity, sustained release, increased antigen activity, and most, co most importantly, they will be helpful in overcoming immune tolerance. The, the three uh, nano carry systems which we will be assessing in our uh, work is uh, lipid based nano carry systems that is liposomes, cytosomes, and solid nanoparticles. These are the different factors which affect the uh, effectivity of nano, nano, nanoparticles that is size, shape, charge, and root of administration. It is, uh, it is stated that uh, around 100, 100 nanometer nanoparticles with spherical size are more optimum for uh, pulsing dendritic cells. Now, when we talk about female reproductive tract cancers, as we know that around 30% of the total cancer cases are from reproductive tract in females, and uh, cervical, ovarian, and corpus uteri contribute to around 70 to 75% of total cases. A major problem with this type of cancers is clinical relapse, and this clinical relapse is due to the mainly due to the residual tumor cells, also known as tumor initiating cells. These, these cells are the cells which survive uh, standard ther therapies, and on cessation of the therapy, 
they, uh, they possess the ability to regrow and uh, regrow and, and metastasis, which, which, which needs the adaptation of global targeted therapies for better management of residual diseases to prevent cancer recurrence and extend survival. Now, in this regard, if we incorporate dendritic cell based vaccines, uh, they can be helpful in eradicating the residual tumor cells. And if you incorporate nanotherapeutics with these dendritic cell based uh, vaccines, this will be more helpful in uh, selected targeting of tumor initiating cells. Now, these are the molecular vectors. Uh, we conducted our study in two phases, in phase 1 and phase 2. In phase 1, we performed a comparative assessment of uh, different tumor antigens to identify an optimum tumor antigen to pulse dendritic cells. And then we performed, we used this tumor, identified tumor antigen and we performed a comparative assessment between different lipid based neurocarry systems. As I stated earlier, the liposomes, ethosomes and solid embedded particles. The experiments were performed in allogenic settings. Uh, because it needs a lot of standardization and uh, uh, patient samples are, uh, we have a uh, less number of patient samples. Then we took this identified nanocarry system to second, uh, to next phase, there we performed our experiments in autologous settings and we, uh, we assessed that whether this nanocarry system, uh, pulsed dendritic cells are capable of uh, generating a tumor specific uh, immune responses or not. Now, these are the uh, phase 1 investigation where we use three cell lines, uh, ovarian endocarcinoma, endometrial and cervical. And these are the three, anti three different antigens which we prepared. We prepared cellular acids, apoptotic cells and uh, cellular nucleic acids. We used whole tumor based approach because uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, it has been already stated that these uh, whole tumor cell based approaches are uh, express uh, many known and unknown tumor antigens. And we performed comparative assessment and on comparative assessment it was observed that in comparison to apoptotic cells and DNA RNA, cellular lysates are more potent to activate dendritic cells for generation of immune responses. And then we used these tumor lysates, we encapsulated them with liposomes, cytosomes and solid dependent particles and we observed them for qualitative and quantitative uptake and their ability to induce DC maturation. Uh, these are the results of our uh, initial uh, qualitative analysis. We, uh, it, is, it can be seen clearly that uh, in comparison to plain lysates, if you encapsulate uh, tumor lysates with, uh, with a proper nanoparticle, it increases their uptake by dendritic cells. And in comparison to liposomes and ethosomes, solid dependent particles are more uh, pro preferably uptaken by dendritic cells. These are the results of quant quantitative analysis that uh, from, from 0 to 24 hours, a, a time dependent increase has been observed in the uptake and maximum uptake was observed in solid dependent, solid dependent nanoparticles. This, later these results have further confirmed that whether uh, after uptake this, this nanoparticle uh, are capable of inducing a, a dendritic cell maturation. So we assessed it through CD1886 markers and we observed that uh, our uh, uptake results were, 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 were validated by these results. As, uh, in comparison to plain tumor lysis, a higher uh, DC maturation ability was observed in encapsulated in nanoparticle encapsulated uh, tumor lysis and the maximum ability of uh, DC maturation was observed in solid dependent nanoparticles. So what we did, we took solid dependent nanoparticles in next phase of our experiments and we surface modified it and performed experiments in autologous settings and observed uh, that whether surface modification further improves their ability to uptake or activate dendritic cells for in, in phase 2 investigation, we took uh, post-operative tumor samples and blood from patients. Uh, we surface modified these solid dependent particles with the help of stellamine and mendog sugar. Uh, we performed experiments for uptake kinetics, their ability to induce TH1 tumor cell specific TH1 responses. Uh, these are the results of nanoparticle characterization to check whether the nanoparticles which we prepared are of optimum size and shape or not. And our results suggested that uh, the preparations are within the range. Now, these are the uptake analysis. We, it is it's clearly seen that uh, solid dependent nanoparticle encapsulation improves the uptake of tumor lysates by dendritic cells. And on surface modification, it further improves and the maximum uptake was observed in nanosilicate form of solid dependent nanoparticles. Now, these are the qualitative results from 0 to 24 hours of uh, nanosilicate solid dependent nanoparticles. And the maximum uptake was observed in 24 hours. Now, an important phenomena, uh, uh, parameter which uh, recently Sir was discussing was nanoparticle induced toxicity. 
If nanoparticles are preferably uptaken and they induce toxicity, they are of no use because cells will die. So we, are, we perform the assessment of nanoparticle toxicity and we observe that in spite of higher uptake of monosalated form of solid particles, they significantly reduces the toxicity of tumor lysids. Now we observe their ability to induce a T cell proliferation and we observe that right from patient 1 to patient 10, a higher T cell proliferation, proliferation activity was observed in solid nanoparticle encapsulated dendritic cells and the maximum ability of T cell proliferation was observed in monosalated form of solid nanoparticles. These results were further confirmed by the analysis of TH1 specific cytokines, IL2, IF and gamma and TNF alpha and uh, the maximum uh, cytokine release was observed in monosalated form of solid particles. We later uh, uh, assessed their tumor cell, uh, tumor cell targeting by, by co-incubating T cells with protologous tumor cells and we observed that in spite of uh, higher uptake and TH1 uh, specific response, a higher tumor cell specific toxicity was observed in monosolated form of solid different particles. We performed a preclinical trial in mice and we opt for just to assess that whether they are preferably uptaken in mice or not and we observed that after 24 hours they are high, highly uptaken. And our results conclude that uh, dendritic cell based cellular engineering vaccines offer the most prospective approach particularly when conventional therapy fails to deliver. Vaccine approaches utilizing solid dependent particle uh, encapsulated tumor lysis more feasible because of their ability to present a broad spectrum of non and unknown antigens. Our results suggest that uh, monosalited solid dependent particle encapsulation further improves their efficiency against tumor cells, uh, further enabling the molecular pathways influencing the interaction between tumor microenvironment and DC activation should be of prime interest. Uh, these are the previous publications of DC engineering. Uh, these are the recent uh, publications in nanomedicine. I kindly acknowledge uh, Department of Biotechnology, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai, where the collaborative work was done, and we which are so fun. Thank you very much. There are different dendritic cells, right? So how do, the, how do you manage the specificity of this? So we just uh, isolated myeloid disease sir, and we performed our, performed our experiments in myeloid disease because generally in phase 1, phase 2 clinical trials, myeloid disease are more preferably used for uh, identification. Because these were ex vivo experiments and uh, we uh, generated it from peripheral monolithic cells and we then uh, encapsulated it. You know, I am asking about the specific to particular uh, there are, uh, sir, actually, uh, there are certain menos receptors which are present on dendritic cells and uh, we observed in our study that monosalated solid solid dependent particles are more preferably uptake, uptaken and this may be attributed to the presence of menos receptors which are present on dendritic cells. This may be due to Any other could be very good for the uh, vaccines, but not for drugs. Because liposomes uh, add to the cost predictably. Because it has been seen with amphotericin B, the Lishmania control, normally amphotericin B costs so low, the moment you add this, the cost goes 100 times up. You don't gain on the although the drug, drug cost is, uh, drug uh, quantity is less, but the cost shows that becomes killing to the patient. So unless it is with a vaccine, it becomes very, very difficult to use either liposomes or exosomes. Kindly consider this aspect to value. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no questions, we will take questions. I have a player of inviting Dr. Sankhya Yadav from Games. I want to Games view that. I would like to thank Professor Loya for inviting me and giving this platform to share my work, which we have done recently in some few months. So I'll be sharing that work with you. Uh, we have done translational proteomics and we want to see how it can help in developing some uh, screening kit in the end. Cervical cancer is a major cancer in the world and it is a major cancer in India also. India accounts for 27% of new cervical cancer cases and India also accounts for 27% of deaths due to cervical cancer in the world. 
So every uh, day 200 women die because of cervical cancer. Eight women die every hour and every seven minutes a woman is dying because of cervical cancer. If you look at the bird population prospect for women, which is uh, greater than equal to 15 years of age, and if we go ahead, you can see that in developing countries, uh, population of uh, women more than equal to 15 uh, will increase uh, uh, with time. And then expected increase in number of cervical cancer cases will be nearly 40% by 2020. And cervical cancer incidences are uh, maximum. You can see that it is 26% uh, incidence in all age groups. And mortality is also very high if you compare it with other cancer, it is around 14. And this is also age specific. Uh, cervical cancer, you get started getting incidence from 15 and then it is maximum between 45 to 54 years of age. And then mortality is also high when uh, incidences are high. And even years of, uh, what years of life lost due to cervical cancer are maximum, you, uh, a lady loses nearly 25 years of life due to cervical cancer. And HPV, as you all know, is the cause of uh, cervical cancer and the high risk strains are 16 and 18. 16 and 18 are the cancer causing type and then 75% uh, of cervical cancer is caused by 16 and 18 type, HPV 16 and HPV 18. <coughs> this is the genome of uh, uh, HPV, it has got uh, late genes and then early genes, early genes are uh, uh, E6 and E7 which play important role in causing cancer and late genes uh, do not have any uh, potential to replicate. And this is how, uh, this is the mechanism of infection which uh, uh, everyone of you know that uh, it invades the cells and then it is engulfed by the episomes and then once it gets inserted into the human genome, it gets uh, multiplied along with the human genome and that is how it infects uh, uh, patient. And the main important proteins which are involved in uh, causing uh, cervical cancer progression are E6 and E7 proteins. E6 protein play important role with uh, P53. Whenever there is a damage to DNA, P53 protein come into the action and then it uh, causes cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. But uh, if E6 protein comes into the action, what will, uh, what will it do? It will ubiquitinize this thing and after ubiquitination, it causes degradation of P53. So P53 is no, P53 is no longer able to uh, what bring about apoptosis and cell cycle arrest. And E7 also is playing an important role. Retinoblastoma protein play important role uh, in, uh, in mitotic cycle and S phase entry. But uh, if uh, E7 protein binds to retinoblastoma protein, what it does, it causes the, uh, it causes more phosphorylation of uh, uh, retinoblastoma protein and then uh, it is no more active. It is not able to cause uh, any uh, change in S phase entry. So that is how it is compromising the mitotic activity over here. Uh, for cervical cancer as uh, Dr. Uh, Anil Suri has also told that uh, whatever tests which are available are pap smear, uh, colposcopy and then they are not very effective in diagnosing the uh, cancer at very early stage. Problem is uh, that women which are suffering from cervical cancer uh, in rural areas or at uh, what say uh, in towns, they are not coming to the centers at uh, to uh, get the pap smear done. Reason is uh, economics is one of the reason and then accessibility, these kind of centers are not accessible to them. And then another thing is discomfort. Uh, coming and it's a privacy issue is there so they would not like to come to the OPD and uh, you would like to tell that in AMS we, we hardly get uh, what cancers which are at stage 1 whatever cancers we are getting are at uh, uh, stage 2 and stage 3 only
Since women are not coming to the uh, center, there is no uh, what biomarker available for the this, uh, screening and uh, whatever uh, screening methods are available, women are not feeling comfortable with those screening methods and accessibility is not there. So uh, see, there is another need to develop a diagnostic and diagnostic through what saliva, saliva is a non-invasive uh, fluid, you can collect saliva and then uh, this saliva can be used uh, uh, to diagnose uh, these cancers and it holds a great promise uh, because it has got an entire library of uh, what proteins, enzymes, antibodies and antimicrobial things which are present in the blood. So it has a great potential to act as a diagnostic fluid for any malignancy. I am talking about cervical and ovarian cancer but it can have potential for any other malignancy also. Uh, since sample collection is easy, storage is easy and then it is non-invasive and there are no privacy issues and no skilled person is required. So even uh, if you have some what kit through saliva, you can take it to the rural areas and no uh, skilled person is required. You just have to collect saliva and I think none of the ladies will have uh, what uh, and any problem in giving saliva for cervical cancer uh, screening process. And it also has got a good amount of protein. So uh, what proteomic studies can also be done through saliva. Uh, in Saliva, many people have used uh, this uh, uh, what fluid for diagnostic marker like uh, it has been used for decades. Uh, mutation in tumor suppressor P53 was first reported for salivary gland adenoma uh, in a pilot study from saliva for breast cancer subject. And uh, there are reports where there are elevated level of cancer antigen CA153 in women with breast cancer as compared to saliva of control. And then uh, uh, what Zhang, Zhang et al has already identified four uh, mRNA biomarker from uh, saliva and uh, uh, some people have uh, what patented, patented salivary biomarker for lung cancer detection in 2012. And uh, these are other uh, biomarkers which are uh, there uh, uh, shown in the literature from saliva for lung cancer, for breast cancer, for head and neck cancer. So research is really going on in this direction uh, uh, in the world. And uh, this is the recent news which we have seen that uh, you can have what uh, uh, POM5 SWIT test that can predict the risk of cancer and it could be available on NHS within five years. So people are really working uh, in the world towards uh, this direction to have saliva as a diagnostic view for different diseases. Uh, for uh, using saliva as a diagnostic, uh, this thing, uh, technological platform is required. It could be genomics, it could be proteomics, it could be microarray. So, uh, technological platform which I have used is uh, uh, proteomic technique, proteomic based approach. It is gel based and non gel based. What we have used is gel based approach. In non-gel based approach, less sample is required, but uh, uh, it requires lots of uh, funds for doing non-gel based uh, things. In gel based proteomic studies, what you have to do, you have to do 1D and 2D, and then you have to take control and disease samples, and you can label those samples with the side eye, and then you can see which are the differentially expressed proteins in your uh, samples. And after detecting those uh, differentially expressed proteins in the samples, what you can do, uh, you can take it to mass spectrometry, identify those proteins uh, uh, by uh, first lipsonize it and then identify it or if you are using a non-gel based uh, approach, you can take directly saliva to LCMS and see which are the uh, peptides which are present there and which are uh, down regulated or up regulated. And you can label your uh, peptides, the labeling methods are available like eye track and SILAC if you want to what, uh, label your uh, cell lines and see which are the peptides which are over or under expressed. And once you have, uh, uh, once you have uh, what, detected those proteins after detection, you, can, uh, you cannot uh, just say that these are biomarkers. You have to validate for validating. You can do Western blotting, dot plot, ELISA, immunohistochemistry, and then tissue array, SRM and MRM. In our lab, we have uh, started this project uh, uh, two years back. Ethics permission was received in 2013 and then we started collecting samples for ovarian and cervical cancer. And uh, these were saliva samples which we have collected. 
so this was the inclusion criteria. We have taken only stage two and stage three carcinoma uh, uh, patient because we were not able to get enough quantity of uh, stage one uh, cancer because uh, ladies were not reporting when they were at stage one. Patient below 60 years of age were taken into account and then exclusion criteria was uh, ladies who were suffering for some other comorbid morbid conditions like hypertension, diabetes, HIV were excluded from the studies, tobacco user were excluded and even people who were taking alcohol were excluded from the study. Uh, so this was the protocol we have uh, in the discovery phase we have used uh, 40 normal healthy control and 40 cervical uh, uh, patients. Uh, we have collected saliva from them and these are the gels. We have run six set of uh, gels in these patients uh, to see which are the differentially expressed proteins in that. And we could get 20 differentially expressed protein from cervical cancer patient in saliva. Uh, uh, these are the differentially expressed proteins, target 1, target 2, A, B and C, D. We have selected because these proteins were uh, what uh, they have shown some role in cancer in other cancers, not in cervical cancer. So we have chosen these uh, uh, proteins and I am not showing that since it is unpublished uh, uh, data and uh, the, the score was very high with these proteins and then we thought that these four proteins can be used as a uh, marker uh, for uh, studying, taking this study further. Then these uh, 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 78 samples were collected and from saliva samples, uh, 78 samples, these four targets were uh, uh, what Western uh, blood studies were done and you can see that uh, uh, there is uh, up regulation of three targets and there is down regulation of one target. So uh, these are important molecules. And then we have also done uh, ELISA and then ELISA also we could get uh, uh, what uh, they are statistically significant. And there is a, uh, uh, we have done it only for target A and B, we have not done it for C and D in this case. So um, uh, this was, uh, these were the results as far as uh, uh, cervical cancer uh, was concerned. Then we have uh, collected ovarian cancer samples also because ovarian cancer is also the sixth uh, most common tumor in women. And this is fifth most common cause of cancer death. Uh, and nearly two lakh cases are diagnosed every year. And uh, so it is important to have a biomarker uh, where it can be screened early. So here also we have used uh, stage 2 and stage 3. Uh, risk factor are family history, age and then late menopause, late childbirth, infertility and genetic susceptibility. Uh, for uh, ovarian cancer also only one um, uh, screening marker is available which is CA125. Uh, uh, which is elevated in 90% of epithelial uh, ovarian cancers but uh, CA125 is not specific for ovarian cancer. He, uh, these levels are uh, high even in postmenopausal women without ovarian cancer and uh, it is also high in many other uh, conditions except uh, ovarian cancer. So you cannot say that CA125 is a very specific marker for ovarian cancer. So uh, another screening uh, test are, as I have said, are ultrasound and then uh, transvaginal ultrasonography and uh, uh, CA125. The only these two screening methods are available and for, uh, since uh, women do not feel comfortable coming to the clinics for a transvaginal ultrasonography, they are not coming. So they are coming uh, at the stage, uh, stage 3 and stage 4 to AIMS. We never, we are hardly getting cases of stage 1 in AIMS. So uh, again there is a need for uh, uh, another uh, uh, what diagnostic kit which can, which can uh, what screen women at large level, government should do something so that uh, these kits can be taken to the uh, government in rural areas and then there it can be screened instead of uh, what treating them after they get uh, cancer. So uh, uh, in this also we have enrolled uh, patients uh, of stage 2 and stage 3 carcinoma and then exclusion criteria was again hypertension, diabetes mellitus and HIV was not taken into consideration. Again tobacco user and alcohol uh, users were also not taken into this study. And uh, we have collected uh, 80 samples for uh, 40 healthy controls and 40 disease uh, individual. Uh, 
from this and again we have done proteomic studies and then six set of gel are also run in case of ovarian carcinoma. Uh, we could see that 20 proteins were uh, overexpressed and 18 proteins were uh, down regulated in case of ovarian cancer. And whatever proteins we got it in ovarian cancer as well as, as in cervical cancer, none of the proteins were common in case of ovarian or cervical cancer. There were different proteins which were differentially expressed. Uh, these are the list of proteins which are uh, which we have seen as down-regulated and up-regulated. Uh, this is the very initial work which we have uh, started uh, in last two years. First, we collected the samples, and whatever work I have presented was uh, work done in last six months. And this uh, more work is in progress. That is, we are doing transcriptomics of uh, cervical cancer tissues, and then we are validating these uh, differentially expressed proteins by immunoassay, western blotting and ELISA and then we are collecting uh, what tissues from the histopathology department to uh, see whether uh, these uh, proteins are present on these uh, tissues also and then a uh, lot more has to be done so uh, I can say that saliva is a promising diagnostic route that can be utilized for early or non-invasive de detection of various <laughs> malignancies and many proteins as we have seen in our study that are differentially expressed in saliva of cervical and ovarian cancer patient in comparison to healthy control and these, potential, these proteins have potential to be developed as biomarker of cervical or ovarian cancer but further validation in large population is required to establish them as a diagnostic marker. Now future uh, prospect is development of diagnostic kit. It is a challenge, challenge to what uh, uh, give this research data and translate into a clean uh, As Dr. Suri has already mentioned that it took him uh, what uh, 17 years to reach that stage. So I don't know how many years I will take uh, to what uh, make this thing uh, to reach to a common man. So it will take time but people are, Dr. Anil Suri is working in that direction, he has uh, got some diagnostic marker and purpose of my study is to what a, a develop a, a specific and uh, sensitive di diagnostic kit, point of care kit which can be taken to a rural population and where no skilled technician or skilled population is required uh, like Dr. Kambo said that gyne gynecologists are less in population compared to what population we have in rural areas. So if we have that kind of device that will definitely help us in screening the population at early stage and then avoiding uh, cancer, cervical and ovarian cancer. And these are my collaborators, Professor Sonesh Kumar, uh, Professor J.B. Sharma, Dr. Dayan Sharma, who has uh, what helped me in giving uh, saliva samples of uh, these patients. And Tajmul is the um, what main person who is doing this work and grant from uh, ICMR are highly acknowledged for this work. And this is my group without which uh, what it is not possible to do any work. Thank you so much. Any queries or questions? If there are none, we can move to the next phase uh, because she is trying to develop a very simple diagnostic on the saliva which can be seen given. But the target stage one, not stage two or stage three. Stage three and stage two can be clinically diagnosed. But yes. as you no, mentioned, no, my, in my rural areas, rural areas, stage yeah. stage rural areas, rural areas, even stage two, nobody knows that stage. Right, thank you very much. Sir.